the idea was really how do we think about an agenda that can be owned by countries that are really involved in the global south in this case. And I think Brazil is also a very good presentation of that. And really Indonesia had their own idea and their own leadership to say the ocean. We are a small island, but we are a large island developing nation. And this is an agenda where we don't have to follow the lead of developed countries. This is an agenda where we can be the leaders and where we can invite our other partners of the G20 who can also be leaders of this. And I think that the commendable thing is, of course, India taking it forward for the leaders' cooperation, the ocean for the leaders' cooperation. And now Brazil taking it to the next level and formalizing it so that over the long term it really becomes a thing that can continue with the targets that are set. And thank you so much for that. Because I know that's your ambition, and I really hope that we are going to achieve that. So I'm going to leave you with three things in which we are very eager to support as an organization and how public private partnerships can, through the G20, move things forward. Number one is how do we keep transforming industry operations. And Eric already mentioned a few of these offshore renewable, transportation, food production systems. All of this can help us to address both the biodiversity and the climate crisis at the same time. But companies cannot do it by themselves. They need powerful political platforms like the G20, with the capital, with the political leverage, to really move it forward. The second one is on conservation and restoration at a large, at a large scale. And here Ambassador Thompson was referring to the high seas treaty, to the Convention on Biological Diversity, to 30 by 30. Again, this is resources, this is partnerships, and this is something that if the G20, with all the ESET and coastline statistics that I gave to you, has the willingness and the ability to deliver on, we will be much farther along. And the third one is that public private partnerships can be used to really foster innovation. This is this is not about G20 big, large corporations only. This is also about job creation. This is also about equity, inclusion. And one of the low-hanging fruits of that is innovation, small and medium enterprises. And really, there's so much space for that in the ocean economy and in the blue economy. And that is another place where I know that many of the people that you're going to hear from today have been investing on and will continue to do so. So with that, I also want to highlight that today we are here because of the UN Ocean Lake for Sustainable Development. None of these things can happen without robust science, and I'm really glad that you are in this panel around because it really represents a coalition of institutions that are behind the claims that we are making today. And I really want to stress that if it's not for institutions like yours, we will not be thinking about the problems and the solutions that we are thinking about. And so, whether it is industry transitions, whether it is good larger scale conservation, or whether it is fostering innovation, it needs good science. And yeah, we we'll need to keep working on So, with that, thank you so much, and uh, hope we can all hear from the panelists. Thank you, Alfredo. And thank you very much for mentioning, I think. When we're talking about growing a sustainable blue economy, we must ensure that this is as inclusive as possible and this is a just transition, both for the industries involved and obviously including developing countries and this new opportunities moving forward. So thank you very much for your comments here. And last but not least, we have with us Alexander. So I return to you, Alexander. Today we've heard some excellent inputs and challenges. And as a professor, I'm gonna I'm gonna repeat your time because I can't repeat it. As a professor at the Oceanographic Institute, University of Sao Paulo, and head of the UNESCO Chair for Ocean Sustainability, you really hold a special position in leading the ocean agenda at the G20. So I would like to ask you, how do you envision the G20 strengthening the work of the ocean decade and vice versa? Who is yours? Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, thank you all for the messages and the inspiration we are having here and the commitment that we are all having together to face these challenges and change some things that are really pressing. And I believe that G20 and O20 is a very important platform that needs to foster what's out there. 
and the ocean it takes out there. But it will finish in 2013. So what are we going to have after that? We need to think about what's the legacy of the ocean decay and how G20 could have a, a very strategic role in helping us, helping us that are learning how to work together uh, to keep going after 2030. That's, a, that's an important aspect that we need to start thinking right now. And then, we also need to think about the post-2030 United Nations Sustainable Development Agenda. What? Which would be the SDGs? 14 will still be there. Yeah. And I think we, we need to think uh, hardly on that and, and make movement so that at least the movement that is starting in Brazil as an official group of engagement of civil society this year recognizing all the effort that was done since Japan and India and Indonesia, we have it represented in South Africa and the US. This is the minimum of the minimum of the expectations, so that we have a process, not only a moment. That said, I would like to say that the ocean is so big that everybody takes inside. And now we are here to do this job and to work together, to learn with each other and to promote the changes, which is a word that I think defines all the four uh, speakers, all the four uh, inspiration behind uh, that talk uh, before me. So, uh, transformation, let's transform together. That's my message. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander, and thank you for your leadership. And before you all leave the stage, please thank all the co conveners. Please give them a big round of applause.
And therefore, at the end of the panel, I will try to sum up and to wrap up some main points that we all can uh, have from this discussion. So please, first, uh, you can have the floor. Thank you, Tana. And uh, after so much preparation, so, so you got my name wrong. <laughs> I'm so sorry, but I'm so used to that. <laughs> so I'm Shivaja, I'm from RISA. So RISA is a coalition of 600 plus organizations covering uh, civil societies, philanthropy, business, uh, small scale fisher organizations, and indigenous groups. And we work on the larger themes on high seas treaty, uh, uh, on laboratory on deep sea mining. Uh, uh, ocean and climate mixes and the sustainable small scale fisheries. So, we are very happy to be in this panel uh, opportunity and we are very, uh, it's so inspiring to see such a mixed panel of academicians, government, civil societies, and so on. So, uh, maybe without much of an ado, uh, I will jump into certain clear cut asks which we have developed uh, uh, through a collaborative approach with our partners. So, uh, on uh, the high seas, let me start with um, our created ask on, on the high seas. Of, of the G20 countries, 17 countries, uh, sorry, 13 countries have signed the high seas, high seas treaty, and seven of them are yet to sign the high seas treaty. So the key message for G20 countries in this context is to ratify the uh, high seas treaty as soon as possible and to contribute to mobilizing resources for its implementation and capacity building. As uh, Dr. Ramakrishna has already mentioned, G20 is the, the platform which has the capacity in terms of economic uh, uh, resources, uh, in terms of the deeper political engagement, G20, if not G20, then who else is a Christian here? So, in, in that case, we also urge the countries to make legislations ensuring that the benefit chain for local communities out of the use of resources from the high seas. It is quite inspiring to note that the countries that ratified the treaty are from the Global South. So in that context, we request the G20 group to continue the legacy and guide as an example for the rest of the countries in proclaiming the commitment to the ocean health. The G20 can also motivate other countries to swiftly uh, secure the 60 ratifications needed for the treaty to enter into force. And also with regard to the high seas, we, we urge the G20 countries to support the moratorium on the deep sea mining. And we also urge the G20 to push for the inclusion of science-based ocean-related measures in their national strategies for both climate and biodiversity. Since parties to the UNFCCC are expected to revise their NDCs by 2030, sorry, by COP30 in, uh, in Brazil by 2025, we call for greater inclusion of ocean based measures, including protecting and restoring coastal and marine ecosystems, decarbonizing the shipping sector, sustainable fisheries and aquaculture, and sustainable coastal tourism to contribute to the climate kind of mitigation and adaptation strategies. Moreover, in the spirit of building synergies, we urge the parties to develop national strategies that are climate smart, biodiversity positive, and benefit people. This is very important to benefit people, particularly to local communities and indigenous peoples relying on the ocean for their lives and livelihoods. steps to achieve the recently agreed putting uh, onto a global biodiversity framework, uh, particularly the target to protect at least 30% of the ocean by 2030. However, while reiterating our support to the uh, putting onto a global biodiversity framework, we would like to highlight the importance of adopting a human rights based approach towards the cons conservation efforts and recognizing, protecting and promoting OECMs including the locally managed areas in an effort to achieve the target the territory of the Kumi Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. And um, it's been very interesting to note that uh, the G20 has been consistently talking about the livelihood of fisher ponds um, uh, uh, and climate change, particularly uh, in Venice and sustainable uh, fisheries. Um, in that sense, we would also like to 
urge uh, or talk about the protection of the uh, I like this something maybe the um, um, uh, protection of fishers livelihoods entry into force of the WTO implement on fishery subsidies and Indian IU fishing have been a consistent discussion theme in the G20 Bali Leaders Declaration 2022 and the G20 New Delhi uh, Leaders Declaration of 2023. Considering that some of the common fishing gear used by small scale artisanal fisheries leads to abandoned, lost, and discarded fishing gears, G20 RD may highlight the need to assist small scale and artisanal fishers to move towards biodegradable fishing gears and involve fishing communities, especially women who rely on the seas for their livelihoods uh, in marine debris retrieval and recycling projects. Small scale fishers is a group affected by, majorly affected by the impact of climate change and hence we urge G20 to assist SSF communities to adapt to climate change in 